This is it, ladies and gents, the official end to an era. This little guy right next to me, the iPod Touch, officially met its fate earlier this month. Now, I know I'm a little late to the news. I was on vacation with my girlfriend, so I wasn't able to upload videos, but I did want to make a quick video going over a little bit of the history of the iPod Touch and what it meant for me. Because my first ever Apple product was the iPod Touch second generation. For all we know, if it wasn't for that simple purchase, I may not even have this tech channel. This tech channel may have never even existed. So after nearly 15 years of being on sale, and after seven generations, the iPod Touch finally got axed. Now you can still buy it, it's still on the Apple website while supplies last. So if you want a small relic of the past, you can still grab this bad boy for around $200 or so, again, while supplies last. So if you guys wanna join me on this quick little field trip and nostalgia trip from the past, let's go over a quick history on what the iPod not only did for Apple, but the entire audio and music industry. Let's hop right in. So this story starts all the way back in 2001. And this year, I was a mere six-year-old who didn't even have any exposure to hardly any technology other than my parents' television. And this little guy, the iPod Touch, didn't come into existence until later on. It has much more humble beginnings, starting with the iPod. This iPod we now know as the iPod Classic, but back then the Classic moniker wasn't attached to it because it was the only iPod available. Therefore, it was just called the iPod. It was this chunky MP3 player that set to revolutionize the world. It was advertised as giving you the ability of having 1,000 songs in your pocket. Now, I know by today's standards, that sounds pretty lame. That's minuscule, right? But back then, it was a big deal. Back in those times, the iPod Classic, this chunky, really big MP3 player that actually, quite frankly, barely fit in people's pockets because of the thickness, had a staggering five gigabytes of memory and it wasn't even flash memory it was actually the kind of storage that had a moving component that you could actually hear the saving and writing occurring in real time it's kind of crazy now when that chunky boy was released it came in at a staggering 399 dollars adjusted for inflation as of the recording of this video that's about 650 dollars give or take a very expensive piece of technological hardware. I mean, imagine paying $650 nowadays for an iPod that did not have cellular capabilities, obviously. It had a physical click wheel at first and went through numerous redesigns up until 2014 when it was officially discontinued and it was quite sad. My cousin actually owned one of these and I used it all the time. It was really revolutionary to have that click wheel. It was something like the world had never seen before and it was very typical Apple and it set the precedent for what the iPod was set to become. Fast forward to 2004 and now we have a very intriguing product that really wasn't even out in the market that long. I'm talking about the iPod mini. So just like today, we have the iPad mini as well as the iPhone mini line as well. Back then, the mini was said to be a smaller brother of the iPod, which had a smaller price tag and of course came in a variety of different bright colors. The iPod mini was sort of a precursor to the iPod Nano, which was shortly released after the iPod mini. Like I said, it had some really fun and bright colors like yellow, blue, pink and gold, and also featured that standard click wheel, just like the iPod classic. Once again, it did not last long because just a year later in 2005, it was replaced by the iPod Nano. Now the iPod Nano was really cool because when it was released, it was one of the first iPods to feature flash storage instead of that physical storage mechanism. This meant that you no longer had to hear the disc reading and writing while it saved. And on top of that, it allowed the Apple engineers to construct this product in a much smaller form factor, which many people absolutely loved. Now, I remember the iPod Nano quite vividly. The first and second generations were this rectangular silver aluminum, you know, MP3 player with a tiny little dim lit display, and it also had the click wheel. 
It wasn't until the third generation that was the most memorable one for me. I did not purchase this because remember my first ever Apple product was the iPod Touch second generation, but many of my cousins did have the third gen iPod Nano. And back then I remember people dubbed that the iPod Nano Chunky or the iPod Nano Fatty. And that was because it was drastically reduced in tallness and it was slightly thicker. Once again, it came in a variety of colors and as you'd expect, it featured more and more storage over time. That's gonna be a theme here. So I remember during the iPod Classic, I remember when 20 gigabytes on the iPod Classic was seen as something out of this world. Now we're accustomed to seeing one terabyte devices such as the iPad Pros. Then the iPod Nano fourth generation was released and it was elongated once again. I'm not sure what happened there over at the design team at Apple. I quite don't understand why people didn't like that design. I like that it was a lot smaller. Sure, it was a little chunkier, but it wasn't too fat and it allowed people to easily store it in a purse or a pocket. But yes, during the fourth generation, it was elongated again, brought in brand new colors. And then when the fifth generation came out for the iPod Nano, it came with a microphone and a camera, which once again, back then was seen as a prestigious feature to have on an iPod. Crazy how when you look at technology from back in the day, these features that we now take for granted, I mean, think about it. You think of every single cellular device to feature a microphone and camera, but back then those were high quality features that came with a premium. Then Apple did something very interesting that may have laid the foundation for this guy right here, which I'm forever thankful because as you can see, my band wall, if it wasn't for the iPod Nano 6th generation, who knows when the Apple Watch may have been released. And that's because the iPod Nano had this very strange, very weird design language. So Apple and the design team went back to the drawing board and completely redesigned the iPod Nano. It was now this tiny square, one inch by one inch multi-touch display that was not so great. It featured a clip, it had really small buttons, and it was just really finicky to deal with. It honestly felt like a downgrade. You no longer had the camera. If you wanted to listen to radio, you actually had to plug in some headphones, so it's not like it had a built-in speaker either, and that tiny little display was pitiful. Sure, I was a kid back then, but I would imagine adults, you know, with big hands and large fingers would have a really tough time pressing whatever they needed to on that tiny little display. But what I meant about the Apple Watch is that some Apple lovers and enthusiasts started to use this as a watch. Now, of course, Apple did not intend for the 6th gen iPod Nano to be used as a watch, but on the iPod Nano 6th gen, you could have the display, the wake screen, to be a clock. So over on eBay, third-party manufacturers went ahead and created their own watch straps to accompany the Square iPod Nano 6th gen, and people started wearing them as watches. It was actually a time to be alive. It was way ahead of its time, way before the Apple Watch was ever introduced, and it's just neat. It's a nice little relic from the past that if you do have one, you should probably save it because I promise you, 20, 30 years from now, that thing is gonna belong in a museum. It was honestly hated by the general public, but it's just an interesting piece of technology to look back on. Apple totally did a 180, kind of, and they backtracked during the seventh generation. So they elongated it once again, but it wasn't as tall as the prior fifth and fourth generations. It was a happy medium between the taller fourth and fifth gen style and the small square style, and it did retain that multi-touch display with a small button that basically was a home button. So you were able to navigate it in a similar manner that you would an iPod, but it did not come with iOS. It featured its own software and it was very primitive. There was no app store. You couldn't download additional apps. It was just also a weird product, but it was an upgrade from the sixth generation. The iPod Nano line sadly met its fate actually not too long ago. It was actually in 2017 when the iPod Nano line was discontinued. So if we compare the very first release of the iPod Nano line in terms of chronological order of when they were released, the next one was the first generation iPod Shuffle. This thing was released in 2005 and really resembles a white, plastic Apple TV remote. It was weird. It also doubled as a flash drive, which a lot of people don't know. So it was this long, skinny, white, glossy rectangle. But now us seeing this with our 2022 eyes, you'll notice something right away. Yep, there was no display here. 
All you had was a click wheel and at the very bottom was a detachable portion that you use to charge the device or use it as that flash drive. You could also buy an additional accessory to attach a lanyard to that detachable side. So if you're running or something, you could attach the lanyard to your wrist but again, it wasn't the lightest thing in the world and it wasn't the smallest either. Again, think about a full-fledged Apple TV remote, only a little taller and a little thicker, just waving around while you're running. I would imagine that'd be pretty uncomfortable. But then, the second generation was released shortly after that and it greatly reduced the size of the iPod Shuffle. Once again, we had no display, but at the top we had our power button as well as your playback buttons. So you could play your music in shuffle mode or you can play your music in chronological order. This was during the time of Apple's history when voice recognition was starting to become a big thing, which Apple fully utilized during the third generation release, which we'll get to in just a second. Apart from that, the second gen iPod Shuffle came once again in all of those flamboyant and very energetic colors. I remember all the commercials and everyone in my middle school had the iPod Shuffles. They were just very convenient, pretty affordable, and best yet, they now came with a nice little clip. Now that clip might not seem like a revolutionary idea or a feature, but it was really nice to have such a small MP3 player that you could attach to your jean pocket, to your shirt, to your shorts while you're running. It was really versatile, although it was an easy MP3 player to lose or have stolen. It was just very tiny, no display, you just had your click wheel and you just had your music shuffle. And of course, by this time, as you'll know, over the years, the storage just got better and better. It was dubbed by Apple as the world's smallest MP3 player at the time. Then comes the third generation iPod Shuffle and I don't know what Apple was thinking here. I really have no clue. So the iPod Shuffle was even smaller. It was a little taller, but it was tiny. And there were no physical buttons on this device aside from, I think, the power button. It was weird. It did also come with a clip, this stainless steel clip. And by the way, there was, I believe, a stainless steel offering for the entire iPod Shuffle third gen, which, of course, as you might know, was extremely susceptible to scratches, but it did look pretty clean, especially if you put a case on it, which back then there were plenty of third party case offerings available over on websites such as Amazon or eBay. This device was the one that featured voice control, which I had mentioned earlier. And there were really two ways that you could control your music. And honestly, they were pretty boo-boo, like they were trash. I don't know what Apple was thinking. So in the box, when you got your iPod Shuffle third generation, it came with headphones that also had media controls right on them. But what this meant is that if you happen to lose those headphones and maybe you didn't want to spend all that money on official first party Apple headphones and maybe opted for third party, if those third party headphones had no media controls, tough luck. The only way you were able to control the Shuffle third gen at that point was with voice control. And as you might know, Sometimes voice control, even in 2022, Siri gets voice messages wrong almost half the time. I would say that of all the voice assistants available, Siri is the absolute worst. And that's coming from an Apple snob. So again, no on-device controls. If you lost your headphones and there was no way to physically press buttons, it was just a horrible idea. And just because it was that much smaller and thinner, it was just prone to get lost anywhere. And of course, back then there was no find my, so if you lost it under your couch, good luck. So then finally, the last generation of the iPod Shuffle did revert back to that second gen design, only this time it was much squarer. On the second gen Shuffle at least, it was designed in a way that there was some room for you to place your thumb, that way if you're pinching the clip and attaching it, or maybe just even holding the shuffle, you weren't prone to hitting any of the buttons. But on the fourth gen, that small thumb space was removed and now it was just this perfectly small square with media controls on the front and obviously once again, no display. Now this one in 2015 did receive an update but it was only in the form of new colors and bigger storage options. But just like the iPod Nano, five years ago in 2017, the iPod Shuffle was discontinued officially, 
and nowadays it's actually pretty hard to find those. I want to say that during 2016, 2017, those things ran for about $50. To find one brand new is gonna be really hard and I one day do wanna get my hands on one. And now we arrive at the iPod Touch. So once again, going in chronological order from the first generation of each type, the iPod Touch was released in 2007 alongside the first generation iPhone. So this was a very interesting time for technology. There's no denying that the iPhone revolutionized the entire world. So when the iPod Touch was released alongside with it, they were basically seen as the exact same product. They both had that iconic home button. They both featured the same 3.5 inch multi-touch display. The only difference is that of course the iPod Touch had no camera in sight. It had no built-in speaker either. Instead, it was funnily enough, it did have just a small minute speaker that you could hear whenever you typed, but you weren't able to play music or YouTube videos on it. You weren't even able to switch your background when iOS was first released on this thing. You were forced to just have that black background. And remember during this time, there was no app store. So the apps that came in by default were all the apps you ever got until later iterations. The second generation iPod then came along and that is where my story begins. Now remember this one was slightly more curved on the back. Remember at this time, there's still no FaceTime. So there's no front facing camera. There's no back facing camera. There's none of that. That iconic stainless steel back was just itching to get scratched the very moment you took it out of the box. So the second gen iPod touch was the most iconic. I remember this era of my life very vividly. It was really awesome to have, but unfortunately it got stolen from me during PE back in, I want to say freshman year of high school for me. And it was a tragedy. My parents had saved up so much money to get me that iPod just for it to get stolen. Oh man, they were livid and they did not buy me another piece of tech for a while. So then shortly after that, the third generation iPod was released and it was more or less a spec upgrade. The main differences was of course the chipset. The RAM was doubled from 128 megabytes to 256 megabytes. Ooh, sounds like a lot, right? It's really not, but back then it actually was. And the storage was doubled to 64 gigabytes, the most that many Apple products had at that time. And nowadays it comes as the base storage option. So you can see all those years and 64 gigabytes nowadays in 2022, some of Apple's products still feature them as base storage. I think that is ridiculous. And in 2022 at a minimum, I think 128 gigabytes should be standard across the board. But when the fourth generation came out, that was the era of FaceTime. That was when the iPods also featured a retina display, which was miles ahead from the prior display. This was just a revolutionary iPod and this was when I was forced to buy it myself instead of my parents buying it for me with my first ever job at Burger King. And I loved this thing. The only thing about it is it was very sharp across the edges. So this one was a lot flatter. It was very skinny. It was actually kind of hard to hit those buttons on the side since it was so sharp and they were so angled. So aside from that though, I'm probably nitpicking, but it did feature a potato-like FaceTime HD camera on the front, which back then was a big deal. No one really cared about the megapixels. What was important was that there was a camera on the front and back. It was a very iconic iPod that lasted a very long time until the fifth generation was released and the display was now taller to follow through with the transition from the 4S to the iPhone 5. And for those that do remember, the iPhone 5 was the first ever iPhone to feature a screen enlargement. So it went from, I wanna say 3.5 inches to about four inches or something like that. It may have been 4.5 to five, I forget, but I'm pretty sure it's four inches. So it kind of resembled the same design of the iPhone line. And it also featured this interesting button on the back. You could press it and attach a lanyard, kind of like the iPod Shuffle first generation. It was weird, not many people used it. I tried it, it was a horrible idea. Your iPod Touch just felt like it was gonna fly out of your wrist at any moment. The lanyard that came along with it wasn't extremely sturdy. It just was not a good idea. And in future generations of the iPod Touch, as you can see that little button there on the corner, obviously it's absent here, uh, but that was removed. So then we come into recent memory with the iPod Touch 6th and 7th generation. 
This is the seventh generation. Once again, the main differences between the sixth and seventh generation iPod touches are mainly internal, both being spec upgrades, different color options, and stuff like that. There really wasn't any major redesigns. So then the seventh generation, which is what I have right here, this was the very last iPod touch. And now that this has been discontinued, that marks the very end of the iPod line. Now I have a lot of memories with the iPod Touch and it's really sad to see that these things are slowly gonna be a thing of the past. Now I know what many of you guys are thinking, but Juan, the iPhone is essentially an iPod. Every single thing that an iPhone does, the iPod can do, only the iPhone does it better. And you're right, you're absolutely right. After a while, especially in 2022, there was no place for the iPod in Apple's entire lineup. I mean, realistically, if you think about it, even for those parents that said, well, I don't know, this might make a great gift for a child. Well, yes, that's true, but you can just buy a prior generation iPhone, like let's say an iPhone 10 or maybe even an iPhone 8. Even the current iPhone SE third generation isn't that far off in price from what this thing came in at. I wanna say that the base storage was about $200, and if you wanted to get 64 or 128 gigabytes, I forget what was the max, I think it's 128, it went up to $299. Imagine paying $300 for this thing. For just a little bit more money, you get an iPhone SE third generation. And if you truly don't want your child to have cellular capabilities, just don't put in a SIM card and boom, you have an iPod on the iPhone SE. So over the years, I don't blame Apple. This was just starting to become really archaic. I somewhat saw it coming. There were just no more redesigns on this thing. They were all internal upgrades and the processing chip on this is still pretty decent, but current iPhones are just gonna blow it out of the water in terms of gaming and in terms of multitasking. So while it is sad to see these things go, I am still very happy and very thankful for the iPod line. They bring me a lot of nostalgia and thanks to that initial purchase by my parents, it has instilled this love of tech products and especially Apple products that will last me probably an entire lifetime. I owe the iPod line a lot because again, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, had it not been for purchasing my first ever iPod, who knows if this tech channel would even be in existence. Now, quick side note, I remember I had a brawl with my brother and cousin back then because they were team Microsoft. If any of you guys remember, the Zune HD was the competition to the iPod. But of course, in hindsight, now we know that the Zune was completely crushed and obliterated by the sales of the iPod Touch. And the Zune met its fate a lot, lot, lot quicker and wasn't even on the market all that long. So Microsoft did try pretty hard to dethrone the iPod Touch or at least try to capture some of that market but it failed miserably and of course the iPod came out on top and now it's finally discontinued. So that's been it guys. I really hope you enjoyed this brief history of the iPod line. If you ever own an iPod, whether that be the iPod Classic, the Mini, the Shuffle, the Nano, or the iPod Touch, let me know which iPod was the one that introduced you into the Apple game if it was in fact your very first Apple product because I know this guy brings a ton of nostalgia for me and it will always have a very special place in my heart. So I owe the iPod line a lot. It was the first product that really intrigued me about Apple and it eventually led me to purchase future Apple products and eventually create this channel so I can bring you guys informative content on not only Apple products, but technology as a whole. If you enjoyed this video, guys, a like goes a long way. If you guys want more tech content just like this where I'm face to face, please consider subscribing. Drop a comment letting me know what future videos you'd like to see. And with that being said, hope you guys take care of yourselves and each other, and I cannot wait to catch you all in the next video.